Good Sunday morning. Welcome to Church of the Cross on this last Sunday in January. It's kind of hard to believe that we're already here, but I'm not complaining. I just saw this morning it's only six more Sundays until spring, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Actually, it made me think of the uh, saying from the old famous baseball player Yogi Berra. He was once asked, what do you do? Or excuse me, it was Rogers Hornsby. He was once asked, what do you do in the wintertime? He said, I sit by the window and wait for spring. Well, I'm an old baseball player myself, so I totally understand that. I'm waiting for the grass to turn green. We can be outside and enjoy the weather again. But until we get there, we'll deal with the weather. It hasn't been too awful bad this year. Anyway, we're glad that you could join us this morning for worship and a time when we can reflect on what God has to say to us and for us. Don't forget, if you are a member of Church of the Cross, that today, immediately following worship at 11 a.m., we will have our annual meeting of the congregation. That will be via Zoom. That link was sent out to you either by letter or in the email, along with the packet for the meeting. So be prepared to log on to Zoom at 11 a.m. Uh, you have to give us a few minutes after worship to get some things set up, but we will be there right at 11 to start the meeting. Also, don't forget, we are right in the middle of our mission for a month, and that is to share love in our world, to do random acts of love for other people, whether it's somebody we know, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's even a stranger, but what our world needs now is a lot of love. Friends, today we're going to be thinking about freedom and what that freedom actually means, our freedom in Christ. And one of the things Paul is going to tell us centers on love. We remember his famous words in 1 Corinthians 13. Now faith, hope, and love abide, and the greatest of these is love. Friends, let us pray. Holy God, you confound the world's wisdom by giving your kingdom to the lowly and the pure in heart. Give us such a hunger and thirst for justice and perseverance in striving for peace, that by our words and deeds the world may see the promise of your kingdom, revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, our opening psalm this morning is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is His work, and His righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Friends, let's lift up our voices now as we sing together. They will know that we are Christians. I want to invite our younger disciples to come forward at this time because it's time just for you. We're thinking today, my friends, about love. And all this month, maybe your parents have been talking about it, we're asking people to do random acts of love. And you can participate in this too. So what is something you can do to help out your mom and dad, help around the house? Maybe it's something as simple as cleaning up after yourself without having to be asked to do it. I know that when I was a kid, when I would do that, which was pretty rare, but when I would do that, my mom would always ask us, what have you done wrong? Because I would do my chores without having to be asked. 
But I wanted to do it as an act of love to show that I cared for my parents and I cared for their home and, and that I was taking care of the place. So maybe that's something that you can do. Maybe you could send a nice note to your teacher and thank them for uh, trying to teach you and help you through this really weird time. Maybe you could send a card to one of your neighbors. You could draw a picture and then have it sent or put it in their mailbox. I know they would appreciate that sign of love. There's all sorts of little things you can do to help to share God's love for you and for other people during this whole month when we're doing those acts of love. So I invite you to join in with your mom and dad in doing those things. Find something that makes sense to you, something you really like, and do that for somebody because you know how much you appreciate being loved. So share the love that you have received. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for the love you have for us, the love you have given to us in Jesus Christ. We are thankful for the love of our moms and dads, for our grandmas and grandpas, for our aunts and uncles, for neighbors and friends, for teachers. God, all these people love us and we're grateful. We thank you for their love. Now help us so we can share love back with them. Give us some ideas today so that we can do a nice loving thing for somebody else just because we want to say, I love you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, the source of our love. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by Him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is but one God. Indeed, even though there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge eating in the temple of an idol? Might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling... I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Friends, would you pray with me for just one moment? Lord, speak to these people whom you love through your most imperfect vessel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may remember back just in a few weeks ago, really, in the season of Christmas, when we talked about some of the gifts that we receive in the coming of God as Jesus, some of those great Christmas gifts. And one of them we talked about was freedom. We talked about it in two ways, the freedom from and the freedom for. 
The freedom from was that release that we get, that God has come in the person of Jesus, what we call the incarnation of Jesus, to free us from everything that separates us from God and from one another, boiled down simply from sin. We have been freed from all of those separations by the coming of God. And we talked further about what that really meant. It wasn't just that we were freed from sin, that we were forgiven, that we were made right again with God, but because of that, we were freed for a purpose. That purpose was to love God, to love other people, and to serve God and to serve others with our whole selves, as the psalm said this morning, so that we would praise God with our whole heart, all of us. That's what we were freed for. Now, freedom can be a little bit of a sticky subject for us, especially those of us who live in this country, in America. We get a sense in our country about individual freedom, individual liberty, that I can do whatever I want to do that makes me feel best, highest, most popular, most fancy, whatever it is, that I have the right to do that. And if I were talking to you this morning about American democracy and the sense of those things, then you'd probably be pretty right. You can do pretty much anything you want in this country so long as it doesn't harm other people. But when we are talking about Christian freedom, we are talking about a very different subject. And it's difficult for us because we sometimes blur the lines and we get them confused. We think that our Christian freedom has something to do with our American freedom, our civil freedom, and vice versa. We think that our civil freedom should be reflected in our Christian freedom. But I'll tell you what, Christian freedom has nothing to do with civil freedom. Not even close. As I just said, in civil freedom, we can do whatever it is we want so long as it doesn't really harm anybody else. But in Christian freedom, the first and foremost thing that we are always thinking about is not what do I get out of it? What is the benefit to me? How can I express my freedom? In fact, in Christian freedom, the first thought we are supposed to have is about the other, about our sister or our brother, our neighbor, a stranger. What is it that I need to do in order to love them? I've been freed from sin and freed for the purpose of serving and loving God and other people. Therefore, my freedom means that I have to use it for the benefit of the other. Paul talks about this idea in a concept that we don't fully understand today. In fact, we don't understand it at all because I don't think too many of us have a problem with food sacrificed to idols. Now, I could do a whole thought on that, which I won't today. In Paul's day, almost all of the meat that was sold in the market, the agora, had already been sacrificed to some kind of a deity or an idol. The priests of other religions and sects and philosophies, well, they would take the food, the goat, uh, the chicken, the beef, whatever it was, and they would sacrifice it to that God, and whatever was left over, well, they would take it to the market, to the agora, and they would sell it to try to make a profit. So that food had already been sacrificed to idols, and people pretty much knew that going around. What Paul is saying in this passage is that for people who believe in the one God revealed in Jesus Christ, you know that it's just food, it's just meat, and it was like a statue, and it's not real, and it's fine. You're not harming anybody. Some people had come to the belief that if you eat food sacrificed to idols, well, then you are participating in idol worship. But what he's saying is that when you truly know that there is one God, and that one God was revealed in Jesus, that if you eat meat that was sacrificed to an idol, it doesn't mean anything. You just kind of roll your eyes and eat your cheeseburger. Actually, no, you wouldn't eat a cheeseburger. It was a Jewish society. That's verboten. You eat your burger. But there were others in Paul's society, in the Corinthian society that he's talking about. People who had come up in the idol cults. Not cults in the sense of what we think of, but cult in the sense of a religious sect. There's people who had been raised in it and they had changed, they had transformed, they had come over to understand or started to understand that there was one God and that one God was revealed by Jesus. But they still knew their, their early beginnings. 
And Paul is cautioning those who firmly know that there is only one God to be careful what you do. Because some of the other people around you, some of your sisters and brothers in the church, well, they don't understand what you understand. They haven't reached that point yet. They're still trying to wrestle all of this religion and theology out in their head, and they're not fully understanding of what is happening. And so when you eat food sacrificed to an idol, and you're one of the people who's very strong and know that, well, these other folks think that it's okay. I'll use this more modern example. Maybe it will help you to understand. We know, for example, that about 10% of the American adult population is addicted to, can to gambling, going to casinos or playing online poker or something like that. About 10%. That's a pretty big number. So imagine me in my position as a pastor in the church. I have the freedom in Christ to go to the casino right here in Erie. I can go sit there and put money in the slot machine and pull the handle and I don't have a gambling problem, so I could do that. The problem with that is that you realize as a pastor that a ton of people know who you are even when you don't know who they are. I can't tell you the number of times this has happened in a grocery store. Oh, I've seen you on the internet. I've seen this. Oh, great. Good to meet you. Or I'm Sally Sue's sister's uncle's cousin's brother, and I live next door. Oh, great. Yeah, okay. No idea who you are. But you know who I am. You know my role in the world. And so if one of those people who has a gambling problem is sitting there on the stool and they look over and they see me sitting there pulling it, I'm giving an implicit stamp of approval to that behavior. They'd say, well, it's okay that I gamble because the pastor gambles. We have to be cautious with our conduct. We have to be cautious with what we do and with what we say and what we don't say and what we don't do. Because it sends messages to the world and to other people. Here's another, maybe other real world example. You have a friend, a very good friend, somebody you love dearly. And they have struggled with a substance addiction for years. Finally, they got some help. They went away to rehab. They got themselves feeling better. They're in counseling. They're taking their medications. They're feeling better now and they're doing well. And it's summertime and it's beautiful. And you want to invite them over for a barbecue to welcome them home and they're doing so well. The one thing you should not do at that barbecue is to offer alcoholic drinks while your friend is there. Even though you don't have a problem, and maybe most of your other guests don't have a problem with a substance addiction, it's a shine of respect and love to the friend who does. It's saying that we love you, we welcome you, we want you to be part of this community, and whatever it takes on our part to do that, well, that's how we will express our Christian freedom. That's how we will love you, because that's what you need most. We look to the needs of the other before the selfish desires of the self. And that can be hard for us because we go back in our heads with that whole civil freedom, Christian freedom thing, and we say, but I'm free. I can do what I want. I can make the choices that I wish, and I don't care about the other person. Well, that would be civil freedom. In Christian freedom, we say, I do everything that I do, or I don't do everything that I do because of the other. I think of their needs ahead of my own, because in this example in 1 Corinthians that Paul is talking about, he grounds it all in the notion of the acts of Christ. Do you think that Christ wanted to be tortured? No. That is logically inconsistent. Do you think that Christ wanted to be hung on a cross? We know for a fact he didn't. In the garden the night before his passion, he's praying to God saying, please let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Christ knew that the people could never save themselves, that they needed him. They needed his intervention. They needed his intercession. They needed his act. He did that out of freedom. He freed all of us so that we could be as free as he is so we can free other people. Not so that we have something we can boast in. Not so that we can say we have power over. Well, I, I know more about this stuff than you do. 
I love how Paul begins that 1 Corinthians passage. Well, we all think that we possess knowledge. But when we think we know, Paul says, we don't know anything. It is love instead. That is our main focus. Not that I learned a bunch, I read a bunch of books, learned a bunch of stuff, memorized a bunch of creeds, I know all the doctrines. No. Do we have do we live? Do we exist? Do we exemplify love? And it's a very specific type of love. It's the love that Christ shows. Sacrificial, servant love. Giving love. Not love that demands to receive, but love that is willing to give and to give. That is what our freedom is is all about. We have been freed from selfishness and freed for selflessness. We, were, we stopped being a slave to our desires, to the way of the world, to sin, to brokenness, to destruction, to separation. We were freed from those things in the act of Christ so that we could be freed for the giving of love, the upbuilding of others, sharing God's love, sharing what we have, giving instead of receiving. The Christian life is always about emptying out. Emptying out the brokenness, emptying out the sin, being filled up with the love of God and then emptying it out again onto others. We've been called to pattern our lives in the style, the way of Jesus, the one who emptied himself. Quite literally, it tells us in one, of other, one, of, one other of Paul's letters that he threw away all of his power and dominion and took our human estate. He emptied himself out that we would be filled up so that we could empty ourselves out for others. That's what Christian freedom actually is. We don't point to Scripture and say, but I have freedom and I can do whatever I want. It's not about what we want to do, it's what we ought to do, as that quote from William Barclay said at the beginning of our worship time today. What ought I to do for the other? What do they need? What is their need ahead of mine? How do I show that love? How do I be hospitable? How do I welcome we try to pattern to show the way of Christ. That's what our freedom is. Our freedom is not for ourselves. Our freedom is for other people. For God's will. For God's world. For God's kingdom to come. Not our own. We can have all the civil freedom we want, but if we are going to say that we are Christ followers, that we are disciples of Jesus, well, then our civil freedom needs to rank way lower than our Christian freedom. We can be Christians or we can be Americans. These two things do not coalesce. It's not that simple. They actually work against each other in a lot of ways. I know a lot of people are going to be very upset by that thought. But I'll say it again. We can be Christians or we can be Americans. Being a Christian is about emptying the self out living in the way of Jesus, thinking about the other over the self. Being an American, at least today, has nothing to do with those things. It's about my rights. It's about what I want. It's about getting mine and keeping it. That is contrary to the gospel. It runs counter to it. If we are going to truly say that we are Christ followers, that we are Christians then we're going to be very odd in the kingdoms of the world. We are going to be very strange in whatever nation state we happen to find ourselves at that time. But that's not unusual. The things that Jesus said, the things that Paul said, were completely contrary to the governments of their day. They had nothing to do with what it was. In, in Rome, for Paul being a Roman citizen, it was all about, if I'm a Roman male, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, because I'm a Roman male. And Paul said, no, 
That's not how it works. Caesar is not all in all. God is all in all. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Paul said and did things that ran counter to the government of his day, and it ended up getting him killed. But that is because the gospel always seems to run counter to whatever government it happens to be around them. The things that Jesus said ran counter to the Roman way, to the Herodian way, to the way of the Sadducees and the Pharisees that governed over his region. And so he ended up getting killed. It is a sacrificial life. It's not going to be the same. If we can blend in as Christians with the world around us, then we're just not being Christians anymore. We've become so enmeshed into that civil way that the gospel stopped being proclaimed. The gospel is always scandalous. It is always counter. We have to realize that what Jesus was saying and what Jesus was doing, these acts and his work of freedom, had nothing to do with being free in civil society. had everything to do about the coming of God's reign over and above, over and against civil authority. If we think that the will of God is going to be carried out in civil authority, well, we deceive ourselves. We're telling lies. Because that's not how God ever brought this stuff forward. If that was God's pattern for the world, don't you think that instead of this poor son of a carpenter from northern bum Israel, that the gospel would have come through the civil authority? That Jesus would have been a functionary of the civil authority. That he would have been a governor like Pilate or a king like Herod. No, that's not how it worked. That's an intentional act, an intentional statement on God's part to say that my kingdom and the kingdoms of this world do not intermix. In fact, in John's gospel, Jesus says this to Pilate. Jesus says, as it is, my kingdom is not of this world. Earlier in that same gospel, Jesus, in talking with his disciples, he says, I give to you, but not as the world gives. It's a completely different paradigm. Friends, we're in a time now, and I'm sure we all see it, where we can't tell where religion and civil authority end or stop or start. They seem to be so bled together. That is really, really dangerous. Because that wasn't God's intention for the world. That wasn't God's intention in coming as Christ. I'll say it again, if that had been God's intention, then Jesus would have been the Caesar in Rome, or a governor in Israel, or some other kind of civil functionary. But he wasn't. He was a simple peasant rabbi from northern Israel who walked around healing and caring for the people, loving them, teaching them about God's renewed and brand new kingdom that was breaking forth in their midst. John the Baptist, we heard, and Jesus last week, we heard as well, started proclaiming this word that said, repent, metanoia, turn away, 180 from the way things are, and turn toward the reign of God as it breaks forth in your midst. That reign is counter to civil reign. Our freedom as Christians is not freedom to do whatever we want. It is the freedom to do what God wills for us and God wills for the world. That's going to run counter. These are hard words for us to hear because we live in a civil society. No matter how we want to slice it, we still live in a civil world. We do our best to obey that authority. But sometimes we just can't. Sometimes we can't stand for it. Sometimes we have to call it exactly what it is. Evil, destructive, broken, not God's way. We know what God's way is. We can read about it over and over and over. 
We can read about it exemplified in the life of Jesus in the Gospels. We can read about it interpreted by the Apostle Paul in his letters. We know what God's kingdom looks like. There's no question on this. If we're not following that way, then I fear we are not being gospel participants. That we are no longer free. That we have slid back into the slavery of sin, of our baser instincts. We deceive ourselves, though. We think, well, I, I go to church. I'm, I'm here. I read my Bible. I pray. I must be strong in the faith. Not necessarily. If we're not willing to humble ourselves, to weaken our own stature in the world, then we're not strong. Remember, in the life of Jesus, a lot of his teachings were paradoxical. The first will be last, and the last will be first. To become strong, you must become weak. To become weak means to become strong. If you want to save your life, you're going to have to lose it. That's what Christian freedom is. It's living in the tension of that paradox. It's saying that, yes, there is a civil authority, and we'll obey it as much as we can, but when it runs counter to the message of God, to the will of God, to the gospel brought forth by Jesus, to feed people who are hungry, to help those who are innocent, to clothe them, to take care of them, to love the people that nobody else wants to love. That's what Jesus did. That is living in our Christian freedom. When we mock those who are disabled, when we point fingers and laugh at those who are different from us, when we say that they are not fully human and that they don't exist, we are not being gospel followers. We're not free. In fact, we're bound back up in the slavery of our brokenness. That's not what Christ ever did. The blind, the otherly, abled, the lame, Christ healed them to free them so that their whole lives could be a living example of the gospel which frees us all. Christ fed hungry people he didn't ask them a hundred questions. He didn't ask if they were motivated to do work. He didn't ask if they were lazy. He just fed them because they were hungry. He took care of those that the society that he lived in had forgotten. The civil authority of his day who had a responsibility to care for its citizens had completely overlooked these people. They didn't care. And Christ cared. Christ came to them and changed their lives. He upended the way things were to bring in the way things will be in the coming of Christ again, in the bringing fully of God's kingdom. Christ always worked against the civil authority. There is not a place in the Gospels that I have ever found where Jesus was in obedience to the civil authority or Paul. The Gospel is radical. It's upsetting. It's disconcerting. It knocks us off. Because what we think should be isn't true. The way that God works is very counter to the way we think things should work. And we praise God for that. We praise God for that with our whole hearts because we are freed in Christ. Because we are no longer slaves to the broken way. We have been freed and liberated to God's way, which is beautiful, which is just, which is merciful, which welcomes all people. That is what we were freed for. That's what our Christian freedom is all about. It's about loving other people. It's about helping them. It's about thinking about them before ourselves. It's not about me and mine and what I get. Salvation, we understand then, isn't just about me. It is a classic Reformed principle of Reformed theology. That salvation, God's act of salvation in Jesus is not individualistic. It's cosmological. God is saving the creation. God built it. God wants it. God, this is God's home. And so the act of salvation in Jesus is cosmological. Yes, we get saved in the process. But what were we saved for? Just to say we were? That I'll be in heaven someday? No. No. We were called to live in heaven right now. 
to bring that kingdom of heaven right here and right now. Why do you think Jesus and John the Baptist were forever saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. Not the kingdom of heaven is someplace beyond the clouds in 100,000 years from now. No, it's near, it's right now, it's right here in our midst. It breaks in among us. We were freed to serve in that kingdom right here and right now. To bring heaven and freedom and love and mercy and justice, all the things that God was doing in Jesus, to bring it to the world now. Not someday in the future. The conservative theologian Dallas Willard has said this. He said that the goal of the Christian life is not to get into heaven when we die. It's to live in heaven while we are alive. We live here right now. Every time we do an act of love, when we think about the other ahead of ourselves, when we gather at the table, when we see a person baptized, when we see ordination or marriage, we're seeing little glimpses of the kingdom of heaven breaking in among us. When we are forgiven, when we forgive others, when we give mercy to the people who are ungrateful, we see the kingdom of heaven breaking in all around us. That's what our freedom is about. To be freed from the kingdom, the shackles of the world. To live in the kingdom of Jesus. The one that he himself said is not of this world. It doesn't operate by the world's rules. There are no cutoffs for who gets to receive God's love. There are no tables and charts and graphs to think about who will be fed today. If you're hungry, you'll be fed. If you haven't been loved, you can be loved here. If you have been forgotten and ignored and overlooked, well, this is the kingdom for you. Because it's a kingdom of misfits and rejects and people that nobody else wants. It's a kingdom that is based in the ultimate love of God, and that is huge. That is what we were freed for. That is what our freedom is about. I'll end where I started. If we want to hold civil power, we can do that. If we want to uphold civil authority and say that that is what we need to do, that it's about me and my, and my rights and my ideology, we can do that. But please, for the love of God, don't call yourself a Christian. Being a Christian means being opposed to the way of the world. It means look, looking and listening and acting in the way of Jesus. It means listening intently to the teaching of Paul. It means trying to do for the other out of my freedom. Trying to do for the other more than I would do for myself. Thinking about them ahead of my own needs. Being a Christian means being a rebel. It means getting into some good trouble. It means being against the ways of the world. It means calling evil what it is when we see it and refusing to participate in it. It's looking for the good, the love, the mercy. That's what Christ came to do. That's what he freed us for. That's what we've been called to in our life with Jesus. Friends, let us pray. Holy and ever-loving God, you came in the person of Jesus Christ and you loved us. You forgave us. You drew us back to yourself. Not so that we could boast in how good we are, but so that we could boast in your love, your grace, and your mercy. You have called us and you have created us for a purpose. That purpose is to love you and to love others, to serve you and to serve others. Help us, God, to humble ourselves, to accept your love, to accept the freedom that you have poured out on us, that we would be guided back to you, away from the ways of the world and to your ways your ways of welcoming and loving. Your ways that stand always in opposition to the ways of the world. 
your ways that bring life and peace. Help us, O oh God, to have the courage to think about other people before we think about ourselves. Help us to realize that our choices and our words can be so detrimental and destructive to other people that they upend the peace that you are working for. Help us to think of the needs of other people before we think of our own selfish needs. Help us to think in terms of your love, which is extravagant. Help us, God. Help us to be those who bring your kingdom into this world, who put aside our own and live to serve the one and only Lord of the universe, Jesus the Christ. Give us hope in his coming return. Give us help and strength to serve right here and now. Give us love when we fail. Gracious God, we ask these things for the sake of the coming reign of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Friends, let us sing our final song together. I have decided to follow Jesus. Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus. I, I got those confused. Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus means living for His way, for His will, in His love. We were freed from and freed for an eternal purpose. That was to serve Christ above ourselves, above earthly authority, to serve other people in the same way that Christ did. Friends, that's what we are asked to pattern in our lives. That's what freedom in Christ truly is. It's not about what I get or, or what I receive. It's about how I can give Christ's love. Remember, members, at 11 o'clock, we will start our annual meeting on Zoom. Uh, feel free to log in any time after the service has ended. We'll be with you in just a few minutes when we get things set up. And for others, we're so glad you could join us today. We hope to see you again next Sunday as we worship again at the Lord's table. Until then, take care of yourself. Stay safe. Amen.